So Diana is a professor of chemistry at the University of Buffalo. Uh, her research involves investigating the fate, transport, and ecotoxicological effects of uh, pharmaceuticals, endocrine-disrupting uh, chemicals, and persistent organic pollutants uh, in the environment, wildlife, and our human health. She is the editor of the Journal of Hazardous Materials and author of more than 75 peer-reviewed scientific journals and international articles in international journals. Um, she is the recipient of a Fulbright Research and Teaching Fellowship, which she recently completed in the Philippines. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Agricultural Chemistry at the University of Philippines and a PhD in Analytical and Environmental Chemistry at the University of Kansas. So welcome, Diana. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the in invitation to speak here. Um, actually, I just got the invitation last Tuesday. I, uh, so uh, also, I would like to have a disclaimer. I'm a chemist, so when you ask me questions, be nice, because I'm not a doctor. So especially when you ask about health impacts, uh, I, I know a lot about the chemicals that we measure. I know how to measure them. I've worked for more than 15 years now looking at chemicals in the environment from agricultural chemicals to industrial chemicals to heavy metals. <clears throat> but more and more, the more I work with other people from other uh, uh, science, uh, for example, in public health and in medical school, the more I learn about um, how to connect the chemicals in the environment into human health. So I, when, when I get the invitation, I actually kind of hesitated a little bit because this is not normally the audience I talk to because I, I only know to talk about chemistry. So I hope to, to make it more applicable to you and um, to make it a little entertaining. And um, to do that, actually, I, I think that this is a very important meeting and an important workshop for us all, for women and our children. And for that, I actually brought my beautiful daughter here today, who will who promise she will pay attention. She's nine years old, and I think a lot of the things we do today will impact our children and their children. So, uh, so they, therefore, I accepted this invitation, even though I was advised that. So hopefully, um, I will uh, give you some introduction about some of the chemicals we study. Uh, I've been in Buffalo for 10 years now, exactly 10 years, in fact. Uh, I work on past uh, contaminants. So this this include persistent organic pollutants. Uh, you might heard of the, and I will give you some examples. Uh, chlorinated pesticides that are now banned. Chlorinated flame retardants that are now banned as well. But even though they're no longer used or manufactured, they are still in the environment because they're very persistent. Uh, most I will talk about the present. Uh, which we actually call now emerging contaminants. The present chemicals that are still used, which are brominated chemicals that will be soon phased out as well. And then pharmaceuticals, which of course we use on a daily basis. Some of them are over-the-counter drugs. Uh, some of them are prescribed chemicals or prescribed um, drugs. Um, I won't talk about the future contaminants, but I just want to mention we also now are looking into this so-called engineered nanomaterials. Sooner you will probably hear more of this in the in the press. Uh, we are already using some of these nanomaterials, we call. If you've heard of these uh, antibacterial sacs, they contain these uh, silver nanoparticles. Silver is a heavy metal that is toxic. Uh, there are now, two years ago, uh, there are st studies that show now that when you wash your antimicrobial sacs, which prevents your smell of it from being smelly, um, <laughs> all these nanomaterials actually get into the wastewater and they kill organisms, they are, they, they're toxic, and sometimes when you use the biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant uh, to fertilize field, uh, these nanomaterials are still there so they can be taken up by plants, which we can take as well. So there's actually a USDA uh, grant last year to study the the transfer of these nanomaterials from soil to food to human. So it's, it's an emerging future contaminant. But I won't talk about that because a lot of that is fairly new. Mainly I will talk about this one. Okay. But 
Before I talk about uh, emerging contaminants, I want to give you a little bit of history of what we have done already, uh, and that what, as according to Anahita earlier, what we have learned from the past, uh, we use now in, in the present time uh, to make our chemicals better and greener. Okay, so um, in the past we have the so-called uh, dirty dozen. There's 12 chemicals that were. Uh, banned, and by the United Nations they coined this word 30 dozens because there's 12 of them. Uh, nine of them are chlorinated pesticides. DDT is probably very familiar to many of you. Um, there's one industrial chemical, the PCB, which is also something that probably became a, a household chemical name that you see from the lab canal. Um, so, and then two of them actually are chemicals that have no use at all. They just get produced during the manufacture, so it's byproducts. Um, so I'll give you some chemistry uh, background here, so I know many, probably many of you have not taken chemistry, but because I'm a chemist, I have to I feel obliged to show you some chemicals. <laughs> so I want to show this for those of you who have not taken chemistry or not taken that. So this is a carbon and a chlorine. Carbon chlorine is a very strong bond. So therefore, it's in the environment, it's very hard to degrade this chemical. And you will see a common feature of these chemicals that have been banned before. So DDT is one of those uh, chemicals that was very famous during the Second World War because it was very effective in killing mosquitoes that carry malaria. It was actually called a miracle compound. It pretty much was doing everything uh, as an insecticide. So it was really good um, uh, in fact. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, the person that made this chemical won a Nobel Prize, so it's very ironic. Um, and, and there were a lot of commercials. Uh, I wasn't born back then, but I saw all this commercial from the, from the um, books and from computers. And it's just amazing to me that during that time, DDT was held like a, a very good uh, molecule, a very good compound. So here it says, DDT is good for me. After several years, there's a lot of studies now that DDT is actually a carcinogen, and it, it, it uh, had several deleterious effects in fish and wildlife. And in fact, um, there's this famous book now, maybe some of you are familiar with this book, that kind of revolutionized uh, green revolution and uh, the birth of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, this book, which is actually this, this year is celebrating the 50th uh, year's anniversary, basically uh, revealed all those dangers of chemicals that we uh, didn't know before, uh, all the um, effects of the persistent organic pollutants. Uh, for example, it was, we learned that these chemicals cause cancer um, and some of the wildlife were, the population were declining. You, in the Great Lakes, you must have heard also, some of these bald eagles, the population are declining because the DDT were thinning their shells so they, the eggs would normally break and so the population declined. Um, so after this, actually, after, after this, uh, this uh, revelation that these chemicals are actually really bad, uh, so the EPA banned this, uh, these chemicals but I want to show you some of the chemicals from the, the dirty dozens. So I think even if you're not a chemist, you could see that there is a common feature in these many chemicals that have been banned. This carbon chlorine, heavily, heavily loaded with chlorine. Chlorine, whenever you see a chemical that has chlorine, you, you have to have second thoughts if it's good or bad for you. Mostly they're bad. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, this didn't show up, okay. This is actually didn't show up so well in the, but, but I, this is also a chemical that has chlorine. This is the PCB that uh, was uh, detected in many of these uh, waste that actually in the lab canal story. Uh, this is the chemical that caused birth defects. It's also been banned now. And, and then the, the last two that I mentioned that has no uh, use at all are the dioxins and furans. Now, what's interesting in this picture here, I will show you. So most of the times, the, these furans and dioxins, they are coming from industrial 
uh, manufacturing. But we can also produce it in our backyard. When we burn our plastics and wastes in our backyard, we also produce these uh, dioxins and furans, and these are our carcinogens. So, uh, and at certain conditions, it, it is produced at higher rate. Um, so this is something that we just uh, many of these have been shown to to have reproductive failure effects. Uh, this actually I will emphasize that they are now called endocrine disruptors because they would affect the males and females in the wildlife. Sometimes the so-called feminization of male and masculinization of females. That's when they have intersex. We've seen some of this in the Great Lakes fish. Um, where we would collect fish samples that we would determine their sex, they would be female, but we would see some testes in the organs or uh, male fish that would, would have ovary and egg. So this is one of those manifestations of feminization and masculinization in wildlife caused by these persistent organic pollutants. Uh, compromised immune systems are also, um, have been manifested in gross birth defects and then uh, tumors and cancers is common. Okay, so this is where the chemists were responsible for these bad chemicals, and so therefore the chemists should also think about how to improve uh, these chemicals so that they are more green, they are less uh, deleterious and greener. Okay, so before I go to the chemistry, this is where I was gonna ask my daughter if you could spot the difference, because this will play a role to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Can you spot yeah. the difference, Renee? Yeah. Yes? Yes? How yeah. many? Yes? Three, four, five. How many differences? Oh, ah, yeah. Okay, oh. so, yes? Yeah? Oh, yeah. What do you see? Three. Three. Two. Three. Three. Bird. Three. Bird. The, the petal. The flower. The, 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 the fingers are yeah. the fingers. Yep. You're oh, good. Oh, 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 yes. All right. Now let's go to the next slide. Oh. Can you spot the difference? Chlorine to bromine. Good. The oxygen. It looks like yeah. bridge to me. All right. So by changing the chemistry, uh, you can make a highly persistent polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, to a polybrominated diphenyl ether. So the chlorine and bromine, or the carbon and bromine bond is less uh, strong, so it can debrominate better. And putting an oxygen here can make it more biodegradable, so it degrades faster in the environment. So in theory, it's better. It, it was better than PCB. Uh, Another changing in chemistry, can you spot the difference now? Yes. Yes? They changed the right. hydrogen. Yeah, so, so they changed this chlorine to this. Now it has oxygen again. So by adding oxygen, again, it makes it more biodegradable. The, the microorganism can chew them up better. So from DDT, uh, from DDT to methoxychlor, the DDT half-life is 10 to 15 years, and the metoxyfluor is 4 to 6 months. So there are many things we can do as chemists to make chemicals better. Um, but when you change the chemicals, you also find differences in the effects in humans. So it's not all, you know, live happily ever after. Um, after so, so in 1996, there's actually a kind of a similar book that came out that now talks about endocrine disruptors. So it's not just cancer that we are worried about um, because now this endocrine disruptor, which I will show you uh, or explain to you if some of you are not familiar with it, um, <coughs> happens even at very, very low levels of chemicals. Unlike, for example, uh, typically when, when you see uh, effects of DDT, it's when you're exposed to high levels, high doses. But this is a little more scary because now you sometimes you don't see the the effects manifested physically, but it's on the offspring, the next generation, because it happens in the genes. It happens later on in life. 
and it happens on the it happens both in the high level and the very low level because hormones are very specific. Hormones act at a very uh, narrow concentration. If it's too low, it's bad. If it's too high, it's bad. So that's that's kind of what's scary about these chemicals now. So this that, that book is actually really uh, interesting. It's based on uh, a lot of scientific studies. So it's not a fiction book. Okay, so let's go back to our friend PBDEs here. This is called the polybrominated diphenyl ethers. And I see that some of the talks later in the afternoon also talks about this compound. So again, I'll show you a little bit about chemistry. So poly means many, right? So polybrominated. So when they make this compound, they don't really know how many bromine will incorporate in the chemical. And that's why you have this two brominated. It can be one, it can be two, it can be three, two, two in different positions, sorry. So it can be in many different positions, but in the end, you can also have all these borders brominated. Okay, so there's about 209 of these forms if you make all the permutations. And each of them act differently, and each of them degrade differently. Uh, in fact, some of the, some of the brominated flame retardants have already been banned because they've been shown that they accumulate in the body, they have more effects. So except in the US, except 209, we, this is the 209 is all this bromine is in the chemical. Um, most of them are already banned except the 209. Okay, so why am I talking about this? These chemicals are virtually in all commercial products that we are exposed to. They are flame retardants, so they prevent um, heating and fire to, to happen in electronics, televisions, and they're in our fabrics, carpetings, uh, yeah, upholstery, electronics, cars. They're almost everywhere. So we are exposed to them on a daily basis. Unfortunately, these chemicals are not bonded to carpets, for example. So over time, they evaporate, they glitch off. So it's in the air. If you vacuum the floor and analyze, if you send me your dust samples, if you analyze those stuff in your vacuum, we will find these chemicals in them. It's, it's been many studies done on this, okay? Um, so, when I mentioned earlier that the other PBDEs, the, the different forms have already been banned, it always starts in Europe. You know, Europe is always ahead of us. They banned it in 2004 and we followed in 2005. These are the forms of the chemicals that they banned. These are like four or five bromines because they've been shown that they they accumulate in the body. So they said, well, we will keep this because this is okay. Unfortunately, we've, we now show that over time, this actually degrades to those compounds anyway. So now we have to ban this as well. So the chemicals, again, there are all these manufacturing chemicals in the US have agreed to, uh, to end the production of this, uh, of this tona as well. So by the end of, December 2013, the production and use of this will be all abolished. But all those that uh, products that still contain them, that are still in the market, will still be there. And even if you ban them now or next year, we can expect that these chemicals will persist in the environment um, and will be seen there for a while, for a long time, just like DDT and PCBs. So um, how are we exposed to this? We are exposed to this in many different ways. Um, for people in Asia, like myself, we eat fish all the time. Uh, I was there as I went uh, during my my Fulbright um, uh, fellowship. I was there for six months, and I ate fish every single day, morning, noon, and night. Sometimes dessert. <laughs> <laughs> we eat fish all the time. In the U.S., it's less of a problem because there's I know it's a lot of people who don't really like fish, but there's. You can be exposed in meat products as well, uh, uh, beef and, and chicken and, and pork also have some, some low levels of uh, PBDEs. Um, children are more susceptible to, to this, um, especially when children are being breastfed because these chemicals are fat soluble. They accumulate in fat so they, they, and milk is has a lot of high content of fat, so it's high amount of PBDEs. So this can be transferred from mothers to children. <coughs> and like I mentioned, indoor dust is probably the main source in the US. In countries that have a lot of high pollution, 
uh, this particulate matter, they like also to, this, these chemicals like to stick in those dust particulate matter so it can be transferred to inhalation as well. Um, I want to show you, this didn't show up so well, but I want to show you the effect of banning these chemicals. It's actually a positive thing. So this red thing is the DDT metabolite. This is the, the one that we banned many years ago in 1972. Uh, metabolite is what is it's being converted in our body. So we normally measure the metabolite. And you can see from banning it in 1970s, the decline in the breast milk content. So that's, you can, you can see this reflected in the content of breast milk. Um, this is the PCB. You can also see that because the use of it has also been banned, you can also see the decrease. Now PBDE, which replaced PCB, uh, is this green line. So it, it, it increases here over time. And this is when, in Europe, this is a data from Sweden. They always get the, the first studies in Europe. And when they banned it, 2000, so you can see also the decline. So now remember this green line, okay? These are in, um, this is 2500 nanogram per gram lipid, per gram fat. If you go to the next slide, that green line here is very low compared to the US uh, milk concentration. And there's actually New York here really high, that point is Denver. So compared to European milk, breast milk, human breast milk content of PBD, US is way higher. So we are much more exposed to this. Um, okay, but, but you can see this, this, are, this is a relatively old data. As I mentioned, it's, it's been banned already. And ever since, I, I haven't seen a newer data. Most of the data now that are being uh, taken are, are more on the uh, because now we know it's in the body, now it's more on the effects on uh, children, and I will talk about that in the next slide. Okay, so these chemicals are called endocrine disruptors because they inhibit or they affect our endocrine system. Uh, so the endocrine glands are the ones <coughs> that produces hormones. Those hormones are the ones that dictate our bodily function, metabolism, growth, sexual development, and there's, we have several hormones uh, or in the current system here, but this is again a spot the difference. I think this is my last game for spot the difference. Mm -hmm. Can you see the difference between these two chemicals? This this is a a, a ball and stick model of two chemicals. Actually, several differences, but do you see the general shape and the general yeah. size? It's pretty much the same. Okay, so so. I think you could see here, this is kind of, this is the crooked part here, and that, that's kind of reverse there. But this is the thyroxine hormone that we produce naturally, natural hormone. This is the PBD-47 metabolite that when we, in, when we are exposed to this PBD-47, our body metabolizes it, converts it to, it, it, it call, it's called monohydroxylated, it has an OH. But the thing is, they're very similar in shape, and their size is very similar. So, the next slide will show you uh, that these PBDs that are uh, metabolized in our body will function as an endocrine disruptor. And what it means is uh, illustrated in this cartoon, okay? So these are the two chemicals, the natural hormone that we produce and this is the metabolite of the chemical. We have a lot of receptors in our body that bind these chemicals. Uh, and the one, the hormones, will bind to this receptor and help, help our body to produce whatever it needs. But when we have chemicals that mimic the shape and size of this chemical, it will compete with that hormone. And, and that's why it's called an endocrine receptor. Uh, so you can see this, it's kind of a lock and key mechanism where it fits the, the lock um, and, and, and so it disrupts the function of our body, okay? All right, so fast forward to what have been done over the past several years. Um, one of the more recent ones in 2010 is actually a, a, a breakthrough that showed that in the U.S., and this has now been replicated in other countries, um, 
it was shown that there is a big, uh, a really high, strong correlation between exposure to PBDs and reduced levels of the thyroid stimulating hormones that increases the odds of hyperthyroidism, which is uh, you can see some some people manifested by having goiter, and and. And this means actually when you have a reduced level of thyroid stimulating hormone, you have a, an increased level of uh, the thyroxine hormones that I showed you earlier. Now this was surprising because in many of the rat studies, so normally as scientists we always start with rats, so that's easy to, to do, and a lot of the studies in the previous years would show the opposite effect. When they feed the rats with PBDE, they would see um, high levels of thyroid stimulating hormones, and then low level of the thyroxine. But then in this study where it's now on human population, it's the opposite. So it was kind of a conflicting uh, conflicting uh, evidence. But then just recently, this last year, they have now an explanation that, so again, it's using rat, that might explain the observation in humans, uh, that at low level, so this is the key. All the rat studies previously done were at high levels of PBDs. We are exposed at low levels because it's from the dust, from food. So, so the levels they were dosing the rats that manifested that the opposite effect was that really what was uh, observed now at low levels. So this kind of explained the study or the results for the human population. So now it's, it's shown that at low levels, which is more realistic for us, in rats, they've shown that uh, during pregnancy they have high elevated uh, serum thyroid hormones, the, the thyroxine that I was talking about, large enlarged thyroids, which is the same observed in pregnant women. And then something else that's kind of new, they've seen an overexpression of this uh, protein called osteopontin, which is associated with ovarian cancer. And the thing about this is they only saw it in female rats. So that's female specific. Okay. So these um, endocrine disruptors, they fool the body into thinking that it needs more thyroid? Exactly. Exactly. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. And in, in the effect is dependent on the concentration. Okay. Yeah. So this is that. So two things that came out from this study is it's concentration dependent and it's sex specific. It was only seen in female rats. Um, so I thought that was... Very interesting, I actually just found it uh, when I was searching for some new re newer references for this talk. And then in the next slide, okay, so in, in many of the other studies as well, PBDs have been associated with neurological effects. Some people have said that maybe the increased occurrence or frequency of children having ADHD might be related to exposure to these chemicals. Um, there has been no direct evidence, but it's all kind of a... Um, association with you know these studies and so but there's several groups many independent groups showing the same thing over and over again <coughs> alter thyroid hormone levels not just in women but also in infants neurotoxic effects for those who have been exposed in uterus and also in childhood from from uh, breastfeeding and food significant uh, decrements in motor and mental development negative association with motor, fine motor skills, and then positive association with impulsive behaviors. And then most, more recently, um, I also just, this is two days ago, published in the environmental health perspective as, as a, I was searching for newer studies to present here. This is actually very interesting because so far this is the largest study in humans, in human population. Uh, where they have, they look at school children at the age of five and seven. This was a long-term study funded by the National Institute of Health, and they followed several mothers. This is actually from California. This stands for a Center for Hazard Assessment for Mothers and Children of Salinas. So it's a community in California where they have a lot of immigrants from, the, from Mexico. Uh, so they, they look at PBDE levels in human uh, in mothers when they were pregnant, uh, and then in the breast milk, and then the blood after giving birth, and on the children over several years, they follow the PBDE concentrations. Uh, and what they have found, to summarize it, uh, is kind of a, it's, it's a, the same thing that they found before in previous studies, but now it's higher, it's more, uh, you know, more subjects, so it's 
just confirms that what's been seen before is true. So they have seen poor attention, uh, and they used uh, several tests. One of them that I thought would be interesting is that some of them were using those tests that they use for ADHD problem scale. Uh, they also seen this fine motor coordination effect. Um, they look at gross motor skills, but the impact is more on the fine motor skills. And then on cognition. So it's more of the low verbal comprehension. So that I thought was interesting, yeah. In reference to ADHD children, uh, if you find that the mother is exposed, is there any way that they can break it down before the child? Uh, I don't know the answer, but from a lot of this I knew, as you'd say. Um, is your question if you could prevent it from happening? Maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, normally they have some uh, advisory levels only, and they say, if you're pregnant, do not eat fish. And it's not specific to PBDE, but fish also have high levels of, might have high levels of mercury, PCBs, and other chemicals. So in general, pregnant women are not advised to eat fish. Um, so that's one thing. Yeah. Also, um, when the mother is pregnant, can they, um, when they do blood from the mother, can they um, find out that she has this PBDE in her system? Yes. And then you can break it down? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I know that um, Diana has just a few more slides, um, and I, what I'm hoping to do because we're recording this is to pass the mic around for questions and answers mm -hmm. so that um, we can get the questions on the mic as well. Right. So if you guys can just hang tight for just a couple minutes, I know you, it's exciting that you guys have questions, I just want to make sure that um, we can capture that and have it be really valuable for the people that will be watching it later. Okay? Thanks. Okay. So, next slide. Um, Okay, so one thing about PBDs that you may already know is that they bioaccumulate and biomagnify. For those of you who don't know what this term means, it means that uh, because they're fat soluble, so they don't like water. So in the water, when they get into the water, they're very low concentration. But uh, they actually, when, when, when small fish eat some of the sediments that contain these chemicals and those small fish are eaten by bigger fish, all they kind of accumulate and increase in concentration as you go from lower food web to higher food web. Um, and we've seen that in the in the Lake Erie. We actually have a project uh, funded by US Fish and Wildlife um, where we collect, so this is in collaboration with a biology professor in Buffalo State College and uh, Environment Canada, where we collect water, sediment, you know, ground, ground roby and yellow perch and all the way to wildlife. You, you could see this increasing level of PBDE in, in fish from the Lake Erie. And, and this is not unique. This is the same thing that you see observed in many lakes, in the Great Lakes and other lakes. Okay, because, so the more fat, in general, the more fat content of the fish, the more PBDE they would have, or PCB, or other chemicals that are fat uh, soluble. Um, also, just because uh, this is a, Local regional meeting. I, I wanted to show you. Uh, this is a now a seven year old data. With one of my PhD students many years ago, collected water samples and sediments from uh, Niagara River. So you could see this picture. It's familiar to you. This is Grand Island, and saw that um, there's high levels of PCBs and PBDEs along this area. And this is where most of the industries were or are still. Um, but one thing also that you need to also think about PBDs is that they undergo long-range transport. So even if we, we find it now in the US, we can still get some of them through atmospheric deposition. In fact, one of the biggest sources of PBDs and PCBs in the Great Lakes is by atmospheric deposition coming from other sources. So here is an Asian incident, but it's the same thing here. If you have a lot, so a lot of the electronics waste now coming from Western countries are dumped in China or in the Philippines in Asia, but we will get back those chemicals to atmospheric deposition because they are volatile and they stick to set uh, to dust, so uh, they can come back to us. Okay. Uh, next. Okay, I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I know I'm running out of time, but this is actually something that I work a lot on. Uh, more than the PC, more than the PBDs, I have worked for a long time now on pharmaceuticals in the environment. So I thought I'd give you this um, some of these results. It started in 2002 in the U.S., although again earlier it was seen in Europe where 
These are called the emerging contaminants. It's not because all of a sudden the chemicals started being there. It's because now we have the technology, the tools to detect them in water. Before we didn't have these fancy instruments, but now we can detect them at really low levels. So in 2002, there was a big study uh, uh, published by the U.S. Geological Survey, where they showed many of these chemicals, drugs that you might be familiar with, you know, chlorotetracycline, uh, ciprofloxacin, and you can see that the levels are low, so in microgram per liter, just to put it in perspective, is relatively low compared to pesticides that you would see. Pesticides are typically in 10 to 100 microgram per liter, so these are below, normally below point, below one. Uh, and it took us a while, actually, as I work on this, uh, we, it was hard to get funding because most people say it's very low and these are not toxic because they are drugs that we take, they cure us, so why should we bother, why should we be concerned? Uh, but then in 2008, the Associated Press released this news, and you might have heard it some, some of this, uh, showing now that the prescription drugs are actually coming out in our tap water, in our drinking water. So while we don't know yet the exact risk at these low levels, there's an increasing concern about the long-term effects. It's always the long-term effects that we have to be concerned with. We are dealing with low, with low level chemicals. Okay? So, even Oprah talked about this. And you know when Oprah talks about it, it is important. <laughs> That's right. The year after, the EPA released several millions of dollars to do research in this, to improve infrastructure and current wastewater treatment plant and so on. So uh, we benefited from Oprah. So, uh, and then after that, there was a more scientific uh, work that showed up. And then this one actually might not show so well, but this is, you can compare, this is 930 nanogram per liter, that's atrazine, that's the herbicide that we are using here, compared to, let's say, a 0.84, so that's several fold lower. However, even though these chemicals that are drugs are low, the difference is, they are constantly released in the environment because they come out from our wastewater treatment plant, whereas pesticides, they are only seasonal. And most of these pesticides are, are applied in one specific location and then they're not, they're not um, spread out. So, uh, so it is important to, to look at the sources of this pharmaceutical. Some of them are coming from animal use. In, in, the New, in New York State, we have so many dairy farms. They use antibiotics for therapeutic purposes. Uh, some, some of them uh, may use them, some of the hormones may be used for increasing their milk production. We also use them as well, as you know. And we can just move on to tetracyclines are one of the most highly used antibiotics. The problem is now when you uh, apply the waste of this animals as fertilizer, we spread these antibiotics that are in the manure, yeah. in the field, okay? So the, the problem is that also for the wastewater treatment plant that we have, normally they are, uh, they are made to remove nitrogen and BOD and dissolved organic carbon and so on, but they're not made to remove these pharmaceuticals. So. So when you discharge the effluent, this may contain many of these pharmaceuticals that are not degraded. Um, to the, just show you the effects that we have seen now from this. So as mixtures, you might remember, you might know Prozac, ibuprofen, ciprofloxacin. They've been shown to be harmful to aquatic plants and fish. Uh, low levels may have um, some response to human cells, and um, some plants have been shown to be affected. And most importantly, the most scary part of this is the, uh, the ability of these antibiotics to increase the emergence of antibiotic resistance in pathogenic bacteria. So as you may know, some, some, some patients no longer uh, have developed, have already developed resistance to some drugs and some of the bacteria no longer respond to, to antibiotics. So chemists, medicinal chemists, are being challenged to make better drugs. Uh, I think I'm just gonna go to the end because we don't have time and I would like to have questions for you. Uh, I would like to go to the, the last two slides, I guess. 
Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So how do we remove these chemicals? I always get questions. So they don't get removed in a typical conventional wastewater treatment plant. Uh, an ongoing project in our lab is to look at this advanced oxidation process where they are normally used to disinfect the water before they are taken out. Uh, we have seen that if you use UV, so the ultraviolet plant, um, which are some of the cities now in Detroit and some big cities have this installed, this is actually a picture of, of a wastewater treatment plant where before they uh, discharge the wastewater, the treated wastewater, they go through this series of UV lamp and they disinfect. And they can actually remove some of those, some of those chemicals. So that's an ongoing work. Um, so it's not hopeless, there are many things we can do, and, um, and we just need to look at many different possibilities. With, with that, um, I would like to acknowledge the... Okay, so, so there's, few, there's a hope. I would like to acknowledge the funding agencies that supported my research, and of course, I always like to acknowledge my daughter, who I tortured to come to my talks. <laughs> <laughs> So there has been many similar situations where in the end they find out that some of these health effects can be traced into exposure to chemicals. Um, I don't know what kind of chemicals were manufactured there, but um, if they are organic chemicals with chlorine, I can easily say that that could possibly be a potential uh, source of these um, effects that you're observing. Um, this study that I showed you here, which is specific to that location in California, they studied, they analyzed not only the PBDs, but they analyzed PCBs, pesticide concentration, heavy metals, because those may also have the same effects. So when I talk about PBDE, I should have I should say and clarify that other chemicals may, may give the same effect. Uh, they zeroed in on the PBDE because they, they found this direct correlation. Uh, but they did for these kinds of study, I think what should be done is to measure all kinds of chemicals that have been released in that and see if there's an association between the, the health effects that's be, being observed. Yeah. Did you say something about the, uh, the, the medications? Yes, so now there's actually a lot of organizations, private and also UV is doing that. There are also student organizations that are now collecting drugs uh, without any questions. So they say they actually advertise illegal drugs, whatever, you put it there. Uh, uh, many of these drugs that are no longer used, they might have been expired or, or the patient have died. Uh, it used to be that people flushed them in the toilet and it's not recommended anymore. It's, we have now seen more and more, a lot of times that all these drugs that you flush in the toilet ended up in the environment. So, so we want to collect those. There's a lot of organizations doing that now so that they can be properly disposed. Yes, you mentioned about PD, uh, PD, PDEs in the breast milk. Are they also abundantly present in cow's milk and goat's milk? I, yeah, good question. <laughs> good question. Um, I wouldn't say abundant, but they have been detected uh, at, at much lower level than humans. Um, there's also, there's actually a study, but this one was an accident. I think, I can't remember now, it was in... Michigan, where they accidentally fed contaminated corn grain. to cows. Was grain, it? yeah, it yeah. contaminated grain. Yes, and so of course those population of animals accumulated them. So, um, no, I, I wouldn't want to scare, it's it's, uh, it's probably a very small amount and uh, it's not a problem that has been reported over and over again, so. You know, the, the research um, tells us, well, this is a very small impact, this particular chemical or whatever. Um, isn't it true that it's not one plus one does not equal two, it's one plus one could be three or more in the impact on, um, on the environment? Yeah, very, very good question, because actually that's, that's exactly the short um, the shortcomings of many of these toxicity studies is sometimes in the laboratory, most scientists would do exposure to one chemical and they would see no effect. 
at a certain level, and they would expose another for another chemical, and they would see no effect. But we have now seen that if you mix these chemicals, they have synergistic effects, meaning they one plus one can be equal to ten, um, because at, as a mixture, they would have a bigger impact, bigger toxicity, and that's actually what happens in the environment. So sometimes all the results from the study at, that the exposure at high levels on a single chemical is not reflective of what happens in the environment. Are, are, are we pushing now to do more and taking a look at combinations of chemicals? Yes, yes. there are now newer assays, newer tests that, uh, that incorporate three or more chemicals, but it's still very limited. So it's actually a challenge for scientists, for chemists to, to devise a better technique to measure this in such a way that you could measure. So the measurements now is still not perfect. Do I have PPT easily? Ah, good question. I didn't plant that. Uh, so the question is, do, does she have, does children have PPTs? Actually, this study that in California showed that the children have higher PPT levels than the mothers. Mm. Ask you that. It's a good question. Mm. And why would that be? Um, for, for that particular population, they stipulated that most of the children have higher exposure because of from the breast milk, from the environment, modern environment. Whereas most of the study, the subjects, the mothers they tested were immigrants, so they're less exposed to some of these chemicals. But uh, there are actually um, more studies like that. In reference to the chlorine that's in the water in the pools. Um, how does that affect us when we're in the pools? I know it's supposed to be used to kill germs and infections and stuff like that, but when we go swimming. So the chemicals in the pools is actually interesting. So they're, they're normally chlorinated. Uh, there is the so-called um, uh, trihalomethane, trihalomethane, which uh, some of the chemical, some of the natural organic matter in the water can be chlorinated and become molecules, so you can inhale it. There are some studies on these chemicals that, at high level, uh, can affect liver function. Uh, I don't think there's any study done on humans on the limited exposure of the swimming pool yet. Also, need to ask one more question. In reference to ADHD and Asperger's. Now, I know that they, they're constantly changing children's medicines after they've been on a certain medicine for a while. What causes ADHD? Um, how does the chemicals that they give the children, is supposed to calm them down and slow them down? And tell me about Asperger's. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> yeah. 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 small question. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm just a chemist, so I'm not a doctor, so I would not be able to answer your question. I'm sorry. Um, I, from what I know, it's, it's, there's a lot of questions like that, and a lot of them are unanswered. What these studies are just doing is trying to find some correlation. It doesn't actually mean it, that is the cause. But, but the actual chemicals that they give the children again, to calm them down. Don't you have something to do with that? No, or you've no. done no studies on it? No. I don't have any study on that, that direct, yeah. There's actually a center here in UB who is doing that, where they're looking at the effect of drugs on children, but I cannot speak about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to know about the drinking water in the, in the city of Buffalo, and uh, does it have those chemicals in them? Or, and how often do they test the waters to make sure that the levels are not higher than a body, you know, can withstand. So, <laughs> my students have tested some of the drinking water from the Buffalo area, from Amherst, where we live. And, and we have not detected any of these pharmaceuticals in our drinking water. Uh, the study that I show, okay, before I go that. However, we have this uh, Lewiston High School students uh, who are doing some work in my lab as part of their science project, and they have detected uh, caffeine and ibuprofen in the drinking water that they collected from Lewiston. Uh, but it's very, very low level. Um, this, this, the thing about this, this could be controversial because some of the some of the regulators say 
uh, just because now our techniques are much better, we can detect really, really low levels. But does it mean anything in terms of health? We don't know. So what I can say is, yes, we have detected them some in some uh, drinking water, but at very low level. Now, uh, what I do, what we do in our house, we have these water filters, and they're activated carbon, and they take out these chemicals. Um, so I'm not saying we should do that, but just a precaution, I can do that. It's better. <laughs> so, uh, but we have done some studies, too, of the removal of these pharmaceuticals in the drinking water from this activated carbon. They're very effective. Um, so that's one thing. The study that I showed you where they have shown uh, relatively high or much more detection of these pharmaceuticals in the drinking water was done from California and uh, Arizona and those areas where there is drought. And normally they recycle their water. And during the recycling of their water that they put back in the ground, these this chemicals just go through in the water cycle. So, but we don't have that problem here in New York, fortunately. I'm going to go wander around and see if I can catch folks in the back here. So I just wanted to comment while I'm walking that one of the things about hormone disruption, right, is that the dose doesn't necessarily make the poison. So low dose and high dose are sometimes not uh, connected to the kind of health effects they can have. So that's one of the perplexing things that I think uh, Diana was bringing up. I know you said it was not a water-soluble substance, but with the levels of water in the lake getting lower, I mean, they've been so low the last couple of summers, does that greater amplify the effect? Yes, it definitely does. Actually, uh, there was a study I just saw that uh, the seasonal concentration varies with, in terms of the levels of the water. Yes, um, but most of these are in the sediments. So uh, I think these changes in the water concentration is uh, almost negligible. But you can see that definitely. Yeah. Can you tell me about what diseases this uh, type of contamination could lead to? Are we talking to cancer? Are we talking to type of diabetes? These uh, pharmaceuticals? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, because of the really low levels, there are no known effects yet in, the, in humans. Uh, what you can relate is probably, in terms of problems, it's those people who might be allergic to some of these antibiotics if they're in the water. So, uh, and it, actually, this is the, the thing where we have to assign this, we have to be very careful in terms of relating to, to the public that we don't want to scare you, we're just measuring them, and they're very low levels. So, as, as uh, health effects, you could say that you shouldn't worry at, at, like today, but what what is not known yet is what can happen in the future. If, if someone is exposed long term, no one has done that long term chronic effects study. And, and mostly the one that has been documented is on, on wildlife, not on humans. But we already know the cancer rates are going up. Yeah. yeah, I don't think she's talking about the antibiotics. I think she's talking about the endocrine disruption. Ah, okay. okay, okay. So the endocrine disrupting chemicals, yes. Um, the, so the, the PBDEs have been already associated with cancer, um, yes. And typically, organic chemicals that are, are highly chlorinated or brominated, those are some of the chemicals we have to be kind of a... Uh, be careful. Uh, in fact, because they're banning that, they're now banning the PBDEs, they have now the so-called new emerging, uh, new brominated flame retardants. So they have now made, released newer brominated flame retardants that are supposed to be better, more degradable, and maybe less carcinogenic. But nobody knows up to this point because they're all new. Uh, and we're actually just now learning how to measure them. They're very difficult to measure. We don't know yet what their environmental fate is. So there's a lot of unknowns. Whenever you substitute or whenever you phase out a chemical and then you introduce a new chemical, there's always a lot of unknown. So who knows, we may find other problems. So um, I actually, do, we, my organization does a lot of work on uh, flame retardant issues. And I just wanted to note that there's also evidence that the chemical flame retardants don't actually prevent fires. Uh, and there was actually a <coughs> workshop yesterday in Albany with a bunch of the fire service folks uh, talking about how you could achieve fire safety without the use of chemicals, and there are some really good strategies that are emerging. Europe doesn't use as many of the flame retardant chemicals, which is why we see it so much lower. 
Um, and so there are solutions that would involve replacing one chemical with another unknown. I got all kinds of questions, but um, let me just start with saying plastics are such a concern because they're everywhere. I mean, you know, they're in the linings of pop cans and, and Coca-Cola and that sort of stuff is so corrosive anyhow, it's got to eat through that. And then all the folks who are drinking bottled water because they think it's better and it's in the plastic bottle, it's in lines the plastic or the tin cans. You know, I think we just really can't avoid plastics, but um, I'm wondering, does OSHA or any other organizations like that, are they on board with any of this? How about your research funding? I know a lot of that comes from uh, places that are, you're probably going to get some pushback because it's their chemicals. And um, so anyhow, what is the best things that we can do to protect ourselves? Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of us are aware of the phthalates, bleaching from plastics, uh, what we can do to protect us. Um, I've done a few things that are, you know, per personal things, for example, uh, and I don't know how many of you know that uh, there's perfluorinated per substances in the lining of popcorn, micro-removal popcorns, so imagine that, so we don't normally buy those popcorns anymore because when you microwave things, all these chemicals will just come off and you have this in your food. So we don't microwave in plastic containers. Uh, always, yeah, a lot of these uh, containers, unfortunately, are plastic. So when you microwave them, make sure you put them in your plates that are ceramic and not microwave them. When you do this, you know, saran wrap, that's also no, no. <laughs> don't do that because um, the higher the temperature, the, the easier these chemicals will come off. Um, now, most of these drinking bottles will say B BPA free, bisphenol A free, because the BPA is also an endocrine disruptor. So, there are definitely many plastics that are in our, would, would contaminate our food. Uh, my funding doesn't do a lot of this uh, from the OSHA, for example, like you mentioned, unfortunately. It's mostly uh, what I really do is measure stuff from the environment, fish. So we have time for one last question. Um, sorry, Lindsay, I'm going to take it right here. Go. Um, from your studies, okay, in chemistry, and um, what seems to be the issue with the United States and Europe always being the leading? We are well industrialized nation with a lot of advanced technology. What is the issues with the United States of America? Is it profit? Is that what's driving the What is it and can it be overcome that they would be concerned about the environment and the people? Wow. So be close and as uh, I hope my life is not in danger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I I'm from the Philippines, I lived here and I did my postdoc in Europe for two years and I lived in Europe for another one year during, so I see big cultural differences. Um, you're right, it's the profit that drives us to be consumers of these products here. Um, uh, when I was a PhD student in Kansas, when I don't have any more money, I would buy a Big Mac for two dollars. It was very cheap, so we can make, because of uh, the uh, cost of, for example, animal production is lower here because some of them before had used a lot of grow promoters, so the cost of meat is cheaper, so McDonald's here is cheaper. Then I went to Switzerland for my postdoc. I didn't have any more money. I went to McDonald's. The Big Mac was $10. This was 15 years ago. So there, everything is higher, but people are willing to pay the, the price because they, they want to be green and you know environmentally friendly, and a lot of people there use organics, and they they would go to the grocery store and be willing to pay ten dollars more to get an organic vegetable. Um, there's another thing that I was gonna say. I I have observed. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, even the regulations. So I I was working with the U.S. Geological Survey during my PhD and. We were monitoring water, drinking water, and uh, the drinking water limit for Atlasin, for example, uh, 
is three parts per billion in the U.S. Never <coughs> go to Europe, and, and every chemical here has a different drinking water limit. Anachlor would have a different one. Everything is different. In Europe, it's just everything should be 0.1, uh, or the highest concentration of these pesticides that we can allow in the drinking water is 0.1. 0.1 for everything. And, and so that's a big difference um, in terms of what we have here. And in fact, I, I was really surprised because um, I think a lot of this is mainly how much you're willing to pay. In, 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 the Euro, in Europe also, most of the wastewater treatment plants have now converted to ozonation, which is uh, very expensive, but it clears all these chemicals from the wastewater. Not a lot of cities here in the US is using ozonation because it's very expensive. Uh, we still use chlorination, which is not very effective. But in Europe, they use ozonation, they use membrane bioreactor, which is also more effective, but also very expensive. So again, the general theme is they're willing to pay the price. So it comes down to profit. All right, so uh, on that note, I want to thank Diana again.